right, everybody. Good morning. If you weren't woke up before, hopefully you woke up now. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Clyde Ledbetter, and you are uh, have joined our fourth cycle of our Sankofa African History courses, uh, brought to you by Jaku Combat uh, here in Ottawa. And uh, this is our first session and our fourth cycle. So we've been doing this since 2018, and uh, Welcome. Um, for those who don't know the structure of these classes, if you're brand new, uh, we go for about, uh, we try to get to at least an hour. Sometimes we go to an hour and 30 minutes. The first half of our lecture, uh, the first part of our lecture is recorded. Um, and we have two Q and A's. We have one in the middle, which is recorded. And then at the end of the lecture, we have open discussion, which is not recorded. So if you have a question or a comment that you would like to make that you don't want to be recorded, save it to the end. Um, and we turn off the recording and we just have open discussion with community announcements and, and all types of uh, uh, <laughs> items that we bring up. But other than everything is recorded, that way if you miss a session, you have a chance to uh, uh, go back and, and, and learn from it. So this class, uh, what history left out? African history from 10,000 BCE uh, until 711 CE is the time period that we'll be covering. And we'll be talking about events uh, all, and personalities uh, for uh, the next eight weeks uh, from July through August. Uh, so this is our first session. So welcome all of you. Uh, welcome back those of you that have been in our session before and welcome to anyone uh, new who is joining us. Um, stop sharing for a minute. So uh, this summer, uh, I'm going to be joined uh, by a few different uh, young people. Um, one uh, will be my, my, my permanent TA who's been with me for the past couple of sessions, uh, uh, Daniel Roberts III. Uh, he's the one that's been uh, admitting you into the sessions. And he helps me facilitate uh, the Q&A. He's going into his third year at Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, in the Department of Africology. So he studies African and African-American studies. So brilliant young man, and he is joining me. I'm also joined by a number of my uh, summer teaching apprentice, apprentices in our Coppin African Teachers Institute here in Ottawa. Uh, so these are high school and young college students uh, that are learning the art and science of teaching African history with me uh, for six weeks this summer. Uh, we just started this week. So you'll be seeing a presentation from one of them today. And I'll introduce her when we get closer to that uh, presentation, five minute mini lecture. Uh, so uh, you'll be seeing a number of students pop in, and this is how we keep this idea going, keep the uh, teaching of African history alive. It can't just end uh, with those of us that do it now. We have to make sure the next generation is prepared to do that. Uh, so today, we will do an introduction to the course, not just to this course, but why we do these sessions in the first place. Um, and then we will talk about some early history, early man, uh, man's development in Africa, and even man spreading outside of Africa uh, all the way up until the development of agriculture where we'll stop today and pick up next week. Uh, so that's what we'll, we'll discuss. So let me share my screen again. All right, so song we were listening to kind of sets the tone for what we're talking about. And in an interview that I saw with James Brown from the 1980s, uh, he was talking to the interviewer and he said, you know, most people think uh, that the uh, my most significant song, and I'm paraphrasing from what he said, is Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. And he said, that, that song was needed at the time because we were so far behind in our identity and our love for ourselves. He said, but it's actually the next song that came out in 1969. I don't want nobody to give me nothing, open up the door, I'll get it myself, this very long title, uh, that he said was his most significant song. Because he said, we have to get it ourselves. You know, it's one thing to be Black and Proud. He said, you can look at the mirror and see that you're Black, but what do you do with that? You have to go get what you want out of life. You have to do what you have to do for your community. So that's what this, these courses are about. And I love the lyric, don't give me integration, give me true communication. So don't give just tokenism, give me true communication. Don't give me sorrow. I want equal opportunity to live tomorrow. Give me schools and give me better books so I can read about myself and gain my truer looks. This is what James Brown said in 1979. This kind of sets the tone for what we do here. Because oftentimes we lament that in the universities, in the secondary schools, in elementary schools, there's not enough emphasis or taught 
on African history, African world history, Black history, Black Canadian, Black American, Black whatever history. It's not being taught in the schools. And we can lament about that and we can continue as we should continue, we need to continue to keep being on these school boards and going to these curriculum meetings and fighting for that to be included in the curriculum. And quite frankly, we need uh, a truly multicultural curriculum. We need more in knowledge on indigenous history before contact. We need more knowledge on Asian history because we live in a globalized world. But for our purposes, since I'm an African person, my goal is to get more African history in the curriculum. So as we continue that fight on that front to get that done, we also have to have our own institutions and our own areas where we teach this history. We can't just say, oh, well, it's not being taught at school, so we just give up. No, we do it ourselves. We, we set our own institutions, we use the technology that we have here, we meet in person when we can, and we teach this history, whether it's in the churches, whether it's in programs such as this, whatever, uh, we continue to do that. So this is kind of the, the inspiration for this class, the, the, the tone for this class. Now, some of you may be asking, if you don't know me, like who I am and what qualifies me to teach this class or facilitate this class. Um, I'm a college professor. I teach African and African-American studies as well as political science. Uh, for a number of institutions in right now, just in the United States. I'm in Canada, but I teach online uh, for universities in the United States. Uh, the longest I've been at is Cheney University, uh, one of the oldest historically black colleges in the United States. I've been working there since 2013. I also work for Virginia Commonwealth University teaching African American studies. And I work for Delaware County Community College. I've been working for them since 2016. Uh, teaching political science courses and African American studies. So that's my background. My uh, degrees are in uh, my PhD is in African American studies and Af African and African American studies from the Department of Africology at Temple University. I have a master's in international human rights law from the University of Oxford and my undergraduate degrees in political science from the first historically black college, Lincoln University. So everything that I do is a credit to the teachers that I've had. I don't like to start these classes without giving them the utmost credit. You know, first being taught by my parents to you know love African history and love African people. Um, but then once I got into the school system, as you see me here back in 1994, that's me. Uh, I really uh, was you know shepherded by some great teachers in elementary school, Miss Williams and Miss Brown, who I don't have pictures of, uh, but they. Uh, were responsible for recruiting me into the African history competition when I was seven years old and I haven't stopped learning African history since. And these are two books that I always recommend. I'm not sure if they're still in print, but they're really good for young people. Uh, you know, a salute to the uh, historic African kings and queens. It just came out of a, there's a number of these little books that were done by Impact Publications, I think in the 80s. Um, and uh, they might still be available, but they're good little resources. So this is the stuff that I was learning. And I thank Miss Williams and Miss Brown who worked in my elementary school uh, for, for shepherding me into that, that program. Then in high school, I had a great teacher, a great social studies and history teacher, Mr. Ajua Adama at Oliver High School. I always give him credit for showing me a black male teacher uh, who I, I don't think up until, no, I had Mr. Harrison in middle school, but uh, and had Mr. Adama in high school, very influential teacher. Uh, when I get to university, uh, one of, another one of my great mentors, Dr. Zizwe Po, uh, who taught me Black Studies and African History at Lincoln University, a great mentor. Then in graduate school and my PhD, I got the privilege of working with and learning from one of the great Black scholars of our time, uh, Dr. Malefi Asante, who's published over 90-something books and one of the most quoted Africans in the world. Uh, come up with, he came up with the theory and the methodology of Afrocentricity uh, in the 80s and established the first PhD program in African-American studies. We, he gave me the incredible privilege of co-authoring a book with him uh, a, a few years ago. So another one of my great uh, mentors who I give credit to. Uh, oh yeah, this woman, uh, we call it uh, Ia, just Ia Omawumi Ogundiasi, uh, who I worked with, she's a master teacher uh, when I got my first job teaching elementary school, she was the principal of the school. Uh, Ijoba Shule, an African Center School in Philadelphia, um, learned so much about how to actually teach from her. Um, and currently, you know, my great mentor, Dr. Virgilette Nzinga Gaffin of Cheney University, um, who 
always reminds me that she made her first trip to Egypt when I was still in my mother's uh, stomach back in 1986. And she continues to go uh, to Egypt mostly every summer um, and does archeological digs and she teaches uh, classical African history and she's just a institution at Cheney University. So I give her credit uh, as well as one of my mentors. So I'm not, I'm, I'm saying this to say, none of us just come out with knowledge. We're all guided by teachers um, and we have to give them credit for whoever it is that we are and what we become. Uh, it's an incredibly important position. So I never like to start teaching without letting people know the people that uh, shaped and molded me. So I always give them credit. Uh, all right, so key, oh, actually don't look at that. <laughs> One of the things these teachers taught me, all of these teachers, is the importance of assessment. We have to assess where we're at coming into a class and what we've learned coming out of the class. So the first thing we do, and those of you that have taken these sessions before know what this means, uh, we have to start with a, a pre-assessment. Just a quick 10 item, multiple choice assessment just to see where you are in terms of your knowledge. So if you've taken this class before, uh, you should do pretty well on this. Hopefully, that means I was a pretty good teacher, instructor, if you did well on it, if you've taken this before. If you've never taken this, a class like this before, don't worry about not getting all these questions correct. I mean, that's why you're in the class, so that you can learn uh, and, and do well on this and we give it at the end. So if you don't know anything going into this, that's fine. That's not your fault. That's the fault of this, the school systems that we all came from. But at the end of these eight weeks, if you take the post-assessment, you don't do well, then that's my fault. That means I wasn't a good instructor. Uh, so we'll take a little pre-assessment. Um, you can write down your score. You can do it privately, or you can put it in the, in the chat, but send it as a private message to me. Uh, and then I can see what everybody's guessing and I can kind of see who gets the answers right. So uh, we'll, we'll do that. All right, so let's go through this relatively quickly and then we can get into uh, what we had came to talk about. So question number one, those of you who have taken these classes before, this should be relatively simple, easy. Uh, what is a symbol representing the quest for knowledge and the return to the source and also means learning from the past to improve the present and build the future? Is it Ma'at? Is it Ama, is it Iwapele, is it Sankofa, or is it none of the above? And if you think it's none of the above, uh, you can type in the right answer uh, for uh, extra credit. So what do you think, A, B, C, D, or E? You can send the answer to me as a direct message in the chat, or you could just write it down and then remember your score when we go back over uh, these uh, uh, questions um, at the end. So take mm, 15 more seconds to, 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 to try to answer number one. We'll go through these relatively quick. All right, seven more seconds. Okay. The answer to that was D, Sankofa. Sankofa is that symbol. It comes from the Akan culture, uh, what's now Ghana, a little bit of Togo, a little bit of Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, that symbol of a bird a flying forward while it looks back is the Sankofa bird. And it, yes, it means learning from the past to improve the present and the future. You'll see that term a lot. We're gonna talk about it a little bit later. Number two, who was the Senegalese scholar who argued successfully for the Africanness of the ancient Egyptians. This was during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Was that Kwame Nkrumah? Was that Shank Anta Jok? Was that Mansa Musa? Was that Milana Karenga? Or was that Imhotep? Who was the Senegalese scholar uh, that argued successfully for the Africanness of the ancient Egyptians? Take 10 seconds and write down your answer. Okay, three more seconds. Okay, if you answered 
B, Shank Antajok. You are correct. The answer was B, Shank Antajok. And we'll talk a little bit about him today as well. All right, number three. What was the nation immediately south of ancient Egypt that it went to war against, traded with, and with whom it shared a number of cultural traits? Was that A, Zulu nation, B, the Yoruba nation, C, Libya, D, Punt, or E, none of the above? And we're talking about immediately south of Egypt, not completely south, but immediately south of Egypt. Uh, what would that be? Five more seconds. If you answered E, none of the above, you are correct. It is E, none of the above. The nation we're actually looking for is Nubia or Kush. It goes by different names, Nubia or Kush. And we're going to talk about that in a few weeks. We're going to talk about that amazing nation of Nubia. Uh, C, this is a two-parter. So we're looking for two answers. What the, the blank migrations brought what technology to many parts of Central and Southern Africa from about 3000 BCE through 1000 CE? So we're looking, was it the Moorish migrations that brought farming technology to many parts of Central and Southern Africa? Was it the Bantu migrations that brought iron technology to many parts of Central and Southern Africa? Was it the Aksumite migrations that brought bronze technology to many parts? Zulu that brought military technology, or was it none of the above? Um, and again, you can write the answer for extra credit. What do we think? This one's a two-parter, so I'll give you a little bit more time for this. What do you think it was? Five more seconds. Okay, it was, if you answered B, the Bantu migrations, the Bantu migrations brought iron technology uh, to many parts of Central, Southern and Eastern Africa uh, in this long period of migrations that occurred for about 4,000 years. Uh, so very important, uh, we'll talk about that in the upcoming weeks. Who was the lead, the blank was the leader of which country which challenged the Roman Empire with conquest? Was it A, Mansa Musa of Mali? Was it B, Tutmosis of Egypt? Was it C, Hannibal Barca of Carthage? Was it D, Pianca, Pianchi of Nubia? Or was it E, none of the above? So we're looking for the name of the leader and the name of the nation that this leader uh, uh, led. So who was that? person and that place, person and place. Another two-parter, who was that person and what was the place? Five more seconds, so we're halfway through. Okay, if you answered C, Hannibal Barker, who was the leader of Carthage, city-state in North Africa and what's now Tunisia, which we will talk about in a few weeks. And you were correct. If you answer C, Hannibal Barca of Carthage. And we'll talk about the very inventive way that he attacked Italy that some of you may be familiar with. Okay, who were the African Muslims who conquered Spain and Portugal in the eighth century uh, CE? Uh, eighth century, this uh, common era. Was it A, the Moors, B, the Nubians, C, the Aksumites, D, the Zulu, or E, none of the above. So we're looking for the African Muslims who conquered Spain and Portugal in the eighth century. Who were these Africans? A, B, C, D, or E? Five more seconds. If you answered A, 
the Moors. You were correct. We will talk about the Moors at the end of this class. That'll be one of the last things that we talk about. That kind of ends off our, our, our course from year 711. All right. The Egyptian pharaoh who built the temples, uh, who rebuilt the temples and led trading expeditions to punt modern day Somalia was who? Was it A, Minutes, B, Ramses I, C, Ramses II, D, Hatshepsut, or E, none of the above? Who was that pharaoh? So we're looking for the name of that pharaoh. Minis, Ramses the first, Ramses the second, have Shetsu or E, none of the above. Okay. Three more seconds. If you answer D, Hatshepsu, you were correct. We're talking about Hatshepsu, who was one of uh, a number of female pharaohs. Egypt had a number of female pharaohs. She wasn't the only one, she's probably one of the more famous ones, but Egypt had a number of female pharaohs and she was one of the most successful ones. Uh, we'll talk about her. Okay, three more. Who were the, the blank were the female rulers of the kingdom of Nubia slash Kush? So just like Egypt to the north, Nubia and Kush had a number of female rulers. What were they called? Were they called the Kandakes, the Amas, the Nzingas, the Paraz, or E, none of the above? Learn the name of the female rulers of the kingdom of Nubia slash Kush. What were they referred to as? Five more seconds. If you answered A, Kandakes, you were correct. The Kandakes, the Kandakes were the uh, female rulers of Nubia and Kush. And we'll talk about some of the famous uh, ones uh, who fought against uh, external aggression from Egypt and from Rome. Number nine, what was the West African empire that grew powerful in its control of the gold and salt trade between the years 500 BCE and 1200 CE? So a long time, this empire uh, and kingdom was able to control the gold and salt trade was it A, Morocco, B, Ghana, C, Ifeile, uh, D, Dahomey, or E, none of the above? What do we think? Morocco, Ghana, Ila Ife, it's backwards, let me change that. Dahomey or E, none of the above? Five more seconds. If you answered B, Ghana, you are correct. We are talking about the ancient kingdom of Ghana, not where present Ghana is. Present Ghana was named after ancient Ghana. Ancient Ghana was more around what's now Mauritania. Uh, so Ghana, we'll talk about Ghana. And last but not least, true or false, an African woman likely invented farming. Do we think that is true or false, that an African woman likely invented farming? True or false? What do we think? Take five more seconds to think about that. That's a no-brainer. <laughs> if you answered A, you are correct. Yes, it's more than likely in the African context that an African woman invented farming. And we'll talk about the uh, invention of agriculture in a second. So. Add up how many you got right versus how many you got wrong. Uh, keep that number uh, near you or, or in your records so that when we do this at the end of the semester uh, or the end of the eight weeks, you'll have uh, a record of your progress. So if you go from three out of 10 to seven out of 10 or go from two out of 10 to nine out of 10, then you'll know uh, that you paid attention, that you took good notes and that uh, I was a halfway decent instructor. Uh, so uh, keep that with you. All right, let's get back into it. Oops, wait a minute. Ah, here we go. The answer to number five, what was number five? Uh, 
let me go back to it into it. Number five was uh, Hannibal Barca. Hannibal Barca uh, as the leader of uh, Carthage, military leader of Carthage. Not, I, I should have probably uh, uh, specified that he wasn't the political leader of Carthage, but he definitely was the middle, military leader of Carthage uh, who uh, almost conquered Rome, had the uh, military folk, I mean, the political folks backed him up. So let's get started. Uh, again, going back to what we talked about, the, the, term, the name for this class is uh, Sankofa African History Courses. Sankofa meaning learn from the past uh, to improve the future. It's literally a con for return and recover or go back and fetch. Uh, and it's you know symbolized by this bird looking back as it flies forward. Uh, so very important term to know for this class and just to know for, for life because we need Sankofa in almost every aspect of our life. Um, so what are we talking about in this class? We're going to talk about what exactly we're studying and why, uh, how have scholars uh, debated the methods uh, of and the reasons for the study of African history. And then we'll get into the evidence for uh, the environmental factors that led to the development of human civilization in Africa. That'll be our, our, our starting point. So again, just reiterating why we're doing this class and how it came to be. Uh, when we sit down and we actually begin the process of studying African history. We come into some obstacles, things that can be overcome, but make the study challenging. But again, you know, without struggle, there's no progress. So we always got to have struggle and uh, uh, challenges are good. So when we sit down and we say, I want to study African history, but what do we come up against? Well, according to Milana Karenga, a scholar of Black Studies, you know, the founder of the cultural holiday of Kwanzaa, Karenga gives us three obstacles. He says, number one, the vastness of the subject. When we sit down and we say we want to study African history, where do we start? It's so large, vast. Geographically, it's vast, as well as chronologically. Uh, this is how big Africa is. Maps don't always do Africa justice and how large it is. The United States can fit inside of Africa three times. Uh, the United States, all of Western Europe, India, China, Japan, the UK, all of this can fit inside of Africa with room to spare. So we're talking about an incredibly vast geographic space, not to mention the diaspora. Africa has a billion people, and then there are about another close to 100 million in the diaspora. So we're talking about a lot of history, <laughs> thousands of different ethnic groups, uh, kingdoms that have risen and fallen. So where do we start? How, you know, how do we go about approaching this? It's doable. You're not going to learn everything about African history in one lifetime. It's impossible. But we can have general conversations, uh, picking out different aspects and events and personalities, which is what we'll do in this course. This course is not extensive in that once you take it, you'll be a, a, a master of African history. This is a general overview course. We'll give you some basic information and encourage you to go study on your own. We'll provide resources, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but it's just a general overview, just to get your toes wet into this vast ocean of African history. Uh, with the expectation, with the hope, I should say, that you do your own research and you look if there's something that really catches your eye, uh, if you really want to know about a particular time period or a particular place or people, uh, you can do that. Chronologically is vast. In terms of written history, we have about 5,000 years of writing, writing uh, that really it comes out of the Nile Valley. Um, but due to new sci uh, scientific breakthroughs and technologies, we can stretch African history back as to the beginning of, of humankind. So the past 300,000 years. So, but if we're just looking at the recorded history, let's, let's, we'll, we'll just stick there for, with this part of the conversation where Africans say, let's write down what's going on with us uh, in the past, in the present, we'll write it down and we'll, we'll save it. And we have access to those records 5,000 years ago. And then now Valley, they invent writing and, and they wrote everywhere. They were, wrote on the walls, they wrote on the pirate, they wrote everywhere, carved into the walls that we can still look at it today and realize what was going on. That history goes from 5,000 years ago up to today. We have oral history, we have different ways of looking at it. So it's a lot, it's, it's very vast. Although many of us, when we go to school, we only learn about this, this past 500 years, if we get even the, the early part of the 500 years. so. Oftentimes our history is, is, is limited to the period of slavery and colonization. So we get 
the 10 percent of African history of recorded African history that we have access to. So you lose the rest of the 90 percent of African history if you only focus on the last 500 years. So the vastness of the subject, geographically and chronologically, it's one of the obstacles. Uh, the second is the predominance of oral history. And these obstacles are, like I said, they're not insurmountable. And in fact, we can look at them as opportunities to learn. Because so we know uh, much of African history is passed down orally. Uh, and we see that in different manifestations across the continent, in all five regions, in the North, South, East, West, and in Central Africa. And it goes by different names, these, these people, uh, entrusted by the community to hold on to the traditions and the stories and then pass them on in a systematic way from generation to generation. It goes by different names among the Khan, among people in Central Africa, East Africa, so on and so forth. Because of this, the oral history has its, its benefits and its drawbacks, uh, but it's an opportunity for us that really want to learn African history, to learn the languages, uh, connect with folks, and, and reconstruct this history. And a lot of that is being done. So we're taking it from the oral, we're recording it using technology such as what we're on now, we're writing it down and we're saving it. But it has been an obstacle in the past uh, and which it's become an obstacle based on the third uh, area, which is the, and we'll get to that, the European slash Arab conquest of Africa. Karenga only identifies the European conquest, but the Arab conquest of North Africa also contributed to this. Uh, the fact that we don't know as much of the oral history as uh, we should, particularly our professional historians, uh, because many of us have uh, lost that connection. Uh, so that was important. But with the oral history, uh, we can also reconnect African history with through other methods that we'll talk about today. So you got the written record, uh, we have African writing from ancient Egyptian writing that the Greeks called hieroglyphics, that the Egyptians called metameta. Excuse me. We have the Meroaic script, which comes out of what's now Sudan, the, the, the Nubian uh, kingdom, the Nubian empire. Uh, we have it, but we haven't found a Rosetta Stone to be able to translate it. So once we do, we'll have even more information about African history. We have Gez, which comes out of Ethiopia. We have Phoenicia. Uh, which originates in Lebanon, but uh, many of the communities in North Africa, including Carthage, wrote in Phoenicia. Uh, Hebrew, of course, there's a number of mentions of African history in the Bible. Uh, the Greeks wrote uh, about African history. The Romans wrote about things that occurred in African history. And then there were also Africans writing in Arabic. And then there were Arabic scholars that wrote about the time period that we're talking about uh, from toward the later end of the time period of 10,000 BCE to 700 CE, we get more written sources as we get closer to that end period. Then of course, oral history like we talked about, but then if we wanna go further back, let's say before 5,000 years or, or in areas where you don't have the written record and you only have the oral history, you can corroborate, corroborate the oral history with archeological resources, uh, linguistic uh, methods to, re to trace African history and the movement of people through linguistics. Botanical evidence, as people move, they take their crops with them. We can retrace a lot of East African history through the introduction of the banana from Asia, from Malaysia, all the way into East Africa, and how the banana led to the establishment of great kingdoms like Buganda and what's now Uganda. Uh, so botanical evidence. And now, recently, over the past few decades, genetic evidence. We can use uh, uh, genetic sequences and DNA to reconstruct the history, particularly the movement of people out of Africa and throughout Africa and so on and so forth. So we don't have to just rely on number one and number two. This is the old way of doing history. Now we combine traditional methods with new scientific methods to broaden our scope and our understanding of African history. And we have a few surprises that have come from these uh, final four, the archeological record, the linguistic record, the botanical record and the genetic record that tell us much uh, uh, deeper story of African history. In terms of uh, sources, we have secondary sources that are available to you all if you wanna read about anything that I talk about. Because I, like I say in all my classes, just because I'm a professor and I have a couple of letters after my name, doesn't mean you should take everything I say as the gospel truth. I'm 
being transparent with you. I'm not lying to you. Uh, be as honest as possible. And as history changes and things we learn, I try to incorporate that into what I teach. That's why I never teach the same class the same way twice. But you should always do your own research. And one of the ways to start is by looking at the documents that I, I put up on our course website that you can find here that I also will put in the chat. Well, you can uh, look at what's provided there. You can also get some ideas for other areas that you might want to look into uh, to, to see if, you know, to make sure that I'm not BSing you. Uh, I try to back up, I do back up everything I say with at least two or three sources that you can look into yourself. Uh, so please take advantage of that website. And if you want to follow along generally with what we're talking about over the next eight weeks, a great textbook is The History of Africa by Kevin Shillington. It's one of the uh, best books that you can use as great graphics and maps and the chapters are broken down really nicely. Um, it's relatively cheap on Amazon. It's no more than $40. Um, but this is a good resource to use to get a general overview of African history. And I'll put a link to this in the chat as well later on. But like I said, the biggest obstacle has been in the past uh, few centuries, the European and Arab conquest of Africa. This is what has stunted the growth of the study of African history, particularly among, unfortunately, African people. You go to a lot of these history departments, a lot of these history conferences, and people are writing about African history, and they're doing the archaeology and the, the, the linguistic history and the uh, genetic history, all that stuff that's being done. A, a lot of it is being done by non-African people. Um, because of the European conquest and the Arab conquest and everything that came with that, the control of the education systems and our spiritual systems by these outside forces, some of our people, uh, a lot of our people have decided that uh, the study of what happened before those conquests is not important. That the, the, this myth was spread that African people were in darkness and uh, in a state of, uh, uncivility, uh, if that's even a word, I think I'm making up a word, but they were uncivilized and all these things before Europeans came or before Arabs came. That has done a number on our ability to reconstruct African history. Uh, so we have to do our job in, in correcting that. Um, we work with our European, Arab, and Asian brothers and sisters, indigenous brothers and sisters to reconstruct world history. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't be doing that work but more of us need to be doing that work as well and encouraging our youth to engage in that type of work. Uh, this class itself is dedicated to Dr. William N. Huggins, uh, who is the founder of the Harlem History Club. What we're doing now is not new. It's new that we're doing it over Zoom and, and, and we're using PowerPoints and all this, but this idea of teaching African history outside of universities and schools, it's not new. And the Harlem History Club, founded in 1934, is the model that these, these courses are based on. Uh, Dr. William Huggins had degrees from Columbia University, University of Chicago, University of Oxford. He operated during the time period known as the New Negro Movement or the Harlem Renaissance Movement. He was a Garveyite and he believed in using history and combining it with political activism. He was an activist for the uh, cause of, of, of Ethiopia when it was evaded the second time by the Italians. And he brought people together in Harlem uh, to talk about history, to keep it alive. He was unsuccessful as a public school teacher in New York to try to get the New York School Board to adopt African history in its curriculum all the way back in the 1920s. Uh, but he didn't let that stop him. He said, okay, well, if they won't do it in the school system, we'll do it in people's living rooms. We'll do it at YMCA's in Harlem. We'll do it at different places. He owned a bookstore where people came together and they met. And he had contemporaries such as a man named uh, uh, John E. Bruce, who was one of his contemporaries, who had this great quote that I love to read. Uh, the more extensive their knowledge of race achievement, past and present, the greater their respect for their race. This knowledge should be gathered and imparted to the young of the race because it will help to form the character and give them a more comprehensive understanding of the significance of the Negro race. For race is the key to history. This is important. This is what they're saying all the way, almost over a hundred years ago. We got to tell the young people so that they, they respect who they are, they respect their identity, they respect their Africanness, and they can create a better future for us. This is what they were doing with, at the Harlem History Club. Uh, they created resources. Willis N. Huggins and his student, John E. Jackson, they wrote a book all the way back in 1937 called Introduction to African Civilization. Uh, 
look what they were talking about. They were talking about Egypt, Nubia, Ethiopia, Aksum, which is modern day Ethiopia and Eritrea, Napata, Miraway, uh, the Funes, which is, which is Sudan, Bornu, uh, Kordofan, which is uh, uh, North Central Africa, Benin, Songhai, Mele, which is Mali, Bantu, Bashongo, Baganda, Arab Moor, Spain, Zimbabwe, all of these going into Haiti, Ethiopia. So they understood that and the history didn't stop and it went all the way up into the 1930s, what they were talking about in this introduction to African civilizations uh, textbook that they wrote all the way back in 1937. They also created a guide uh, to, the st to African studies back in 1934. Uh, and I loved the, an invaluable and much needed book for teachers in schools and for clubs and other groups desiring to study the history of Negroes in Africa and the United States. So again, I'm just showing this to show what we're doing is not new and needs to be continued. We, we, we can't get uh, uh, happy whenever our uh, curriculum is incorporated in schools because sometimes that's the temporary thing and a new administration comes in and they, they, they take it out. So we always have to have these clubs and institutions within the community that are separate that are able to connect uh, different people that have the desire to learn African history and particularly young people. Uh, I just love where this was. This was in the, the crisis newspaper in 1934 where they were selling this guide to African history and then they were selling African art objects that were coming from Nigeria and different places. I just love these old Harlem newspapers. This is part of uh, black history. So I just love to put it up uh, anyway. One of his contemporaries was Arturo Schomburg. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about Arturo Schomburg. I'm gonna give the next five minutes to one of my students to discuss who Arturo Schomburg was. Uh, and I'm gonna pull up her presentation. And my student is uh, Ms. Jeanette uh, Gooman, who is a phenomenal young person about to enter university, already an international businesswoman. She has a business that goes transcontinental, uh, exceptional young lady who's about to share uh, who Arturo Schomburg was with you uh, for the next uh, few minutes. So give me a second while I pull up uh, her presentation and uh, I will uh, get this going and turn over the floor to her. All right. All right. The floor is yours, Jeanette. Uh, sorry, I can't see the slides. Um, well, good morning, everybody. My name is Jeanette Gooman. Um, thank you, Dr. Ledbetter, for that wonderful introduction. So before we talk about um, uh, Mr. Schomburg, I want to ask you guys the simple question. Um, what is agency? Um, this is something that I haven't read much on, but after attending one of uh, Dr. Ledbetter's um, trainings, uh, I heard this word and I kind of dug deeper. Um, sorry, can you switch the, to the next slide? Um, well, according to the Oxford Dictionary, agency is defined as the capacity of an individual to act independently and to make their own choices. Next slide. Now, why is agency so important for us as Black people? Well, first of all, no community will be able to survive living under a culture, religion, or political theory that they did not in part create. Thus, in order for us to sustain our communities, we must learn to think of our history past what we have seen and heard and have been told. Um, so, sorry, next slide. In order to grasp our agency, we must maintain that it is not enough, as Dr. Ledbetter, Ledbetter was just talking about, um, to, it's, just, it's not enough for us to just learn about the history of Black people and what they've done, but find the relationships of Black people to all people. Because once we understand this, um, we can understand the history of the people who oppressed us, why they oppressed us, and we also learn why they chose to remove us from the history books. And with that, we can gain clearer knowledge on our backgrounds um, that will empower us to decolonize our mind and gain that autonomy that we need. Um, agency has been a major topic in the Black community, and many great minds have taken on this discussion. However, one great mind in particular was Arthur A. Schomburg. I'm um, sorry, next slide. 
author A. Um, author Arthur <laughs> A. Schomburg was an African American Puerto Rican writer, historian, activist who was a leader in both his community. And not only did he serve in both of his communities, not only did he serve in these communities physically, he provided the intellectual evidence to guide young mind, young and old minds, um, on the road to agency. He advised Black readers to dig deeper into the, into the world's history in order to understand who displaced our people from its pages. He influenced many great minds, um, including, sorry, next slide, uh, Jackson G, John Jackson, oh, sorry, John G. Jackson, who was a Pan-Africanist historian, um, activist, writer, and had authored many books on African history promoting Pan-African and Afrocentric views such as Man, God, and Civilization, and the introduction to uh, African civilization, as well as his more popular book, The Pagan Origins of the, of the Christ Myth. Another person that author A. Schomburg um, influenced, sorry, next slide, uh, was um, Edward Wilmot Blyden, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, who was a Liberian educator, a writer, a diplomat, a politician, who was primarily active in West Africa, and his writings uh, were focused on Pan-Africanism, and he's, his work became very influential all throughout West Africa, and even gaining some traction here, not here, in, well, in the United States. Um, he also attempted to create the three-way bridge that would bridge the understanding between African, African-American, and afro Caribbean people. The widespread impact of Mr. Schomburg can be seen through just these two writers, um, but there are many great minds who came about through his teaching and guidance. Um, Mr. Schomburg was at the forefront of the Black Studies Revolution, um, and he influenced many to start their own understanding of agency and protest uh, for our, our oppressed people. Um, so thank you for listening to me. That was a very short presentation. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. See, we're, ladies and gentlemen, we're in good hands with the next generation of, of our teachers. Uh, so that is perfect. So Arturo Schomburg, like, like we, we heard, so he was one of the contemporaries, one of the people that uh, Huggins met with. And there were others during this new Negro movement. You know, people like uh, Antonor Furman of Haiti, uh, Miss uh, Drusilla Houston, who wrote a book about, called The Wonderful Ethiopians. Uh, we have you know, C.L.R. James from Trinidad, W.E.B. Du Bois, Carter G. Woodson, the father of Black History Month, uh, Namdi Ezekwe, who attended Lincoln University, taught one of the first classes in, in, in what they call at the time Negro Studies, who becomes the first president of Nigeria, and so many others, J.A. Rogers, so many others uh, that existed and interacted during this time with the New Negro Movement from the 1920s and 40s. So they did a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Uh, these were some of the giants and pioneers of really ensuring that African history uh, was taught and maintained. Uh, uh, people like John Henry Clark, who comes afterwards, who, were, who came out of this Harlem History Club. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah, when he was a student at Lincoln University, would go up and spend his summers in Harlem and visit the African, uh, the uh, Harlem History Club and learn and interact with these folks. And then he, you know, he becomes the first president of Ghana, who we talked about in our last class. Uh, so classes such as this, you don't know who's in them. You don't know who's learning from them. What ideas are being exchanged and how those ideas are gonna shape the future. A small little Harlem History Club in the 1930s produced all of these great men and women that went on uh, to do great things, including running countries. Uh, so very important why, why we do what we do. The, the next generation after Huggins, you know, we get the great Shank Ujo, who we talked about in our uh, uh, pretest. The Senegalese multi-genius Shank Ujo, born in Senegal in 1923, a multi-genius expert in linguistics, anthropology, Egyptology, physics, and history. Wrote a number of classic texts, like the African origin of civilization, civilization of barbarism, a pre-colonial Black Africa. Uh, in 1987, after he died, actually, the, the university in Senegal was named after him because uh, he, he was always a critic of the government in Senegal, so he waited until he died to name the, the, the university after the greatest intellectual, one of the greatest intellectuals uh, it produced. And he spent his entire life calling for the building of the African Renaissance. This is what Shankar Dijon was about. How do we practice Sankofa? 
learn from our past to build a better future. But I bring up Shank at the joke for a very specific reason, because of all of the areas that he was an expert in. Now, if we go back to this early period of, of, of these thinkers and historians, they're relying on a lot of uh, uh, much of the written record. Uh, these were exceptionally intelligent people that could speak multiple languages, English, French, ancient Greek, ancient Latin, Hebrew, and they were able to look at the historical documents and they were able to show that even Europeans are saying Africa is the birthplace of civilization and, and, and so many other things. But that only takes you so far in terms of the, the written record. What Job was able to do through his knowledge of the physical sciences, of uh, you know, physics and a little bit of biology, and he knew anthropology, he knew linguistics, he was able to provide us with even more evidence that pointed to the African origin of civilization, which was a contested topic at the time because no one wanted to give credit to Africa and African people as being the progenitors of human civilization. It was still being contested. So you had people like Shang de Joke and his student Theophilo Banga and others who had to go to the UN and argue for number one, the blackness of the ancient Egyptians, which we'll talk about uh, particularly next week, uh, but this the African origin or the origin south of the Sahara of general, uh, civilization in general. So what we'll do now is we'll take a break uh, and, and we'll do a Q&A and we'll get into some of the findings that Jope and others uh, presented about the African origin of civilization the, the scientific evidence that we have of early man coming out of Africa and what that meant and some of the early development of mankind uh, in Africa. So we'll probably go today to about 1220. So uh, uh, that will be what it is because the pretest took a, a little bit of time today. So if anybody has any questions, uh, you can put them in the chat or you can use the raise your hand feature in the participants tab and be uh, uh, recognized. So uh, take some time to uh, uh, type your question, or you can raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can ask your question. And Daniel, please monitor the chat uh, for me, see what, what has come up in the chat. So any questions or comments, and this is being recorded. Any questions? If there's none, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. Don't see any. Check the chat, anything in the chat? Okay, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Thomas, go ahead. Morning all. This is more uh, a comment than a question. Your introduction this morning and these courses gives me a sense of what the indigenous people are dealing with in the sense of denial and outright lies. This certainly gives me a better sense of what happened to us especially in the education system that was and still is used as a blindfold. Yes, sir. And that, this is why we always stand in solidarity with Indigenous folks, because we understand exactly what that means to be deculturalized, to have an education system openly hostile to you and your traditions, and then how that affects the next generation. It's not just about what you learn in the facts and figures, but how you see yourself and then what you will do in your community afterwards. Um, so, you know, here in Canada, in the US, other places, we have this issue. Uh, so we stand in solidarity with them and, and look to, to collaborate in any way we can in terms of sharing resources and all that, because that's one area I would like to learn more about in terms of pre-European settlement history of the indigenous population. Who were their heroes and she wrote? Who were their great, uh, leaders and thinkers and philosophers. This is stuff that's a blind spot in my knowledge, and I know it's a blind spot in many people's knowledge that uh, we hope that we, hopefully we can get some answers to uh, and, and learn from each other. Uh, Gina, go ahead. Thanks, Clyde. You mentioned in, uh, I think it was in the, the pretext that um, a lot of the archeological work and so on is being done and then and what well, has been taken over um, by, by white academics. Is there, is there more of a push now um, to invest in, in black academics, in academics that are located and based on the continent, for example? So I know there are a couple of countries, for example, that are going to France, going to Germany, et cetera, and saying, you know, basically give us back our stuff. 
yeah. um, is there is there also a push to whether ask for investment or to, whether to solicit investment from the diaspora, um, specifically for Black archaeologists and historians? You're getting some, and I'm going to actually mention one of them today. You're seeing more Africans from the local areas where these things are are, are happening in, in Kenya, in Ethiopia, in Somalia. Um, and in other places in Africa. And you're starting to see more African names in some of these studies, because usually these are done by teams. Uh, so you'll, you'll see the names of the people that worked on them. And, and more and more, they are becoming, uh, they're uh, more Africans involved in, in these digs. Um, so that, that is an encouragement, but we need to have even more, and even a more emphasis in our community that this is something that people can actually get into. Because you know, unfortunately with us, uh, you know, we tell our kids that if you're not a lawyer, engineer, a doctor, we don't really know what else to tell you to be. Exactly. Uh, so there are all types of things with radiocarbon dating and different sciences and archaeology. Uh, and, and it, but there's, there's a, I understand the reason because our parents want what's best for us. So there's a practical reason. You can come to your parents and say, I want to study archaeology. Like what, it's kind of a, what are you going to do with that and how are we going to pay for it? So th there's, there's a class element to it as well. But if we do invest um, and as a community, put a little bit of our dollars and cents together, we can send our students to these schools to, to learn these skills, to, to record and analyze this history. So it can definitely be done. And, and I think there's a positive, uh, uh, it's going the positive direction in terms of more African presence uh, uh, in, those, in those fields. Um, let me go to, we'll, we'll take the last three more, then I'll get back into it. So I'll go to Amaka, then I'll go to David H., then I'll go to uh, Miss Jennifer Payne. Uh, Ms. Amaka, go ahead. Whoops. Sorry, you have to, sorry, I hit the uh, mute button. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing I, I noticed when you were say, say, um, talking about um, the, uh, learning about indigenous people and their culture like before they were colonized. There was something I saw um, at the BMO Bank, something about free university courses to learn about indigenous people and their culture. I was just Googling to see if I would say it online, but I could not, but I already put up my hands. I'm sorry about that. I should have been sure of my information. But if you go to any BMO Bank, on their display, the advert thing they display, it's one of the things coming up. You know, I wish I had, you know, be sure of that before putting up my hand. I'm oh, sorry. No, thank you for just alerting that to us. Everybody look out for that. So BMO Bank uh, might have, it might be on their website or something. So I'll be on the lookout for that. And I encourage anyone else who's interested to, to do the same. Uh, David H, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ledbetter. I just want to echo the uh, congratulations for Jeanette and her presentation on her lecture. It was well done. And I just want to say how much I appreciated it. Thank you. All right. And Ms. Jennifer, go ahead. Hi, I just want to, oh, I was wondering um, what you thought, I know we talk about uh, things that we can do. What do you think about um, joining the the movement for general um, reparations, um, because um, a lot of people like um, Hillary Beckles talked about when um, the colonial people left um, in the West Indies, for example, there was a deficit of infrastructure, health, education, technology, and um, in terms, you know, I mean, no one obviously expects you to, you to trace like. Um, families and try to give things to individuals. But of course, um, I think if some of the, um, if some assessment was done of the, um, um, the, the value, the treasure taken out of these countries and some portion of it, whether it is you consider the amount that the, the slaves had to pay after emancipation in order to regain what was given to them or what they, they put into the, um, the building of the countries before that. And if some of that was put into um, things like looking at healthcare, looking at the differences between African-American and, um, and West Indian, sorry, 
African, West Indian, African American uh, people and their the differences in their reaction to drugs, for example, which um, some people have linked to their slavery um, education about um, in terms of what was taken away, what was hidden, um, and, and allowing that information to be there. There are whole lots of pieces. Um, so what do you think about um, a focus on trying to rebuild, um, taking, focusing on reparation and taking whatever money or whatever we get and put it into those areas where there are clear deficits um, due to colonization? Yeah, I mean, I'm all for it. And I love the, the 10 point uh, uh, demands that CARICOM created uh, based off of her scholarship. Um, I'm all for it, uh, you know, uh, as much pressure that could be put on as possible. I'm, I'm not as optimistic as a lot of folks, but I'm for the pressure. Um, I think while we, we fight on multiple fronts, so while we do that, uh, we continue to, to build, but that's definitely, neat. that's the just thing to do. I, my, 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 my pessimism was it doesn't come from us. Um, I, I, I'm, not opti I'm not overly optimistic because I don't believe that some of these nations will ever operate with us justly without a change in power dynamic, but uh, we should still fight for it. That's the just thing to do. So I'm definitely in agreement with that. And, but we're seeing some we're seeing some um, recognition of need for reconciliation in terms of the indigenous community, and I think that if um, similar awareness was raised in terms of the the absolute abhorrent things that that happened um, to people who were stolen out of Africa, perhaps some of that can happen. And before I go, I just wanted to say that if you're interested, certainly in the indigenous reconciliation history, um, at both edX and Coursera offer courses that you can pay for them if you need a little piece of paper. But if you don't need paper and you don't necessarily want feedback um, in terms of the assignments, you can um, sign up for free and get, um, and get their information. Okay, all right, yes, any of those resources, please share. Um, and again, this is, a, for those of you that are new, this is a space where we often share resources, different things going on. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. Um, and yeah, I think if there is a time period for, for, for those types of things to happen, this is one of those windows of opportunity um, based on what happened last summer, based on the different things going on, who's in, who's in charge of some of these governments right now, this is an opportunity to make some of those gains and, and to make some of those demands. Um, so we, we, we should do that. Those of you uh, who are able to and, and, and fighting for that, we gotta, we should take advantage of this opportunity time that we're in now. Uh, so thanks for that. So we can have more open discussion on that uh, and, and other things when we come to, to the end. So I'm gonna finish up and then we'll, 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 we'll get back uh, uh, into uh, our open discussion that will not be recorded. So in case you all wanted to say something uh, else. So uh, just going back into that discussion of who are some of these the black archeologists, here's one in particular that I always like to mention uh, who's doing great work, uh, Dr. Uh, Zer Renese Alam, Alam Saget, Dr. Alam Saget of Ethiopia, uh, who grew up where they were doing archaeological digs. And he said, he looked at it, he said, well, if you got these people from Sweden, and Germany, and England coming to uh, dig up my ancestors, I, I want to be involved in that. So he went to school and he learned, and he becomes, he became an archaeologist and he started the, the Kika Research Project, uh, where he's been responsible for amazing breakthroughs over the past 15 years in our, our understanding of early human evolution in Africa and what's called the, the, the field is called paleoanthropology. So he's a paleoanthropologist slash archeologist, a very uh, important figure and name you should know. So this is our typical understanding of what Africa looks like topographically. You know, we see the dominance of the Sahara in the North. We see the, the grassland area here in the Sahel. We see the rainforest of Congo River Basin uh, stretching into West Africa, the, the Kalahari, and, and so on and so forth. But this isn't what Africa always looked like. 300,000 years ago, 
when Homo sapiens emerged, the, the species of animal that we are, because we have uh, uh, big brains and uh, you know different things, we are at the end of the day animals. And in fact, we're uh, we have many of the negative traits that people associate with animals. A lot of other animals don't destroy the environment the way that we do and kill each other the way that we do. So we're not, in fact, and many animals probably won't even want to be associated with us. But anyway, we are animals uh, and our species is called Homo sapiens. When we emerged in Africa and the earliest records from anywhere else in the world, we know that human beings emerged in Africa around somewhere between 400 and 200,000. So we just say around 300,000 years ago in Africa. When we start to uh, get into these types of periods, this is the dating system we use, KYA. So 300 KYA, 300,000 years ago. When we start to get closer to the modern era, this is when we'll, see, we'll start using BCE and CE. So before the common era and common era, or before zero and after zero. We used to say you know, BC and AD, but BCE takes off the religious connotation of that, even though we're still measuring it from uh, uh, you know, the emergence of the, the Christ movement in Palestine. But uh, that is where we get zero and before common era and after common era. So, but anyway, 300,000 years ago, people that look like us, our species emerge in Africa, people that could think just like us. The only difference is uh, they didn't have the accumulated experience that we have. So they're just as intelligent as us, but they just didn't have the accumulated experience. They had to give us all of that. These are the first people that created what it meant to be human, what is going to, in, at least in our minds, separate us from the other animals that roam the savannas in Africa. Uh, so human beings emerge, and we have the evidence that they come in East Africa. We have some fossils even from West Africa, from Morocco but nowhere else outside of the continent of Africa. So the common understanding now is for a, what they call a pan-African origin of man. So we don't know exactly if it was East Africa, because we do have fossils from the same period in West Africa. We know it was Africa that human beings first emerged. And this is the Africa that they lived in. Looked a little different than it was today because of the climate of the world. The world was in one of its more wetter uh, cycles. Uh, the climate change we're experiencing now is not the normal climate change. The Earth goes through climate changes of ice ages, and then uh, which leads to more drying in Africa when there's an ice age, uh, and versus uh, when there isn't, and things get a little bit drier. So we, uh, I mean, a little wetter. But the climate change we have now is man-made. It has nothing to do with the thousand years, hundred thousand years cycles that the Earth goes through. When so human beings emerge. Uh, and we, we, we live in Africa longer than we live anywhere else. We stay in Africa for about 200,000 years uh, before we start populating other places in the world. And a lot of the research says one of the things that pushed Africans outside of the continent was climate change. Things started to get drier. Uh, at, at one point, uh, it was very catastrophic for the small human populations that existed. And in fact, there's a strong belief in paleoanthropology and, 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 and the historical record that at some point the human population got incredibly small to a, like a few thousand people um, and uh, due to climate change and some other things. So all of us that live now, all 7 billion people that are on the planet are descendants of a group of about a few thousand folks uh, who lived in Africa and then spread out to the rest of the world. It's called a population bottleneck. Something happened, some combination of disease, climate change, or something that really shrunk the human population at some point in our past, that we're all descendants from these few thousand people that left Africa. Uh, and we're not sure exactly even on the route that they left Africa. We know it was through East Africa. We don't know if it was from Djibouti into Yemen or Southern Arabia or if it was over the Sinai Peninsula, you know, Northeast, you know, across Egypt and, and into, you know, what's now Palestine and all of that. Uh, but we do know that was the route that was taken. So we spent 200,000 years in Africa learning what it meant to be human before we went anywhere else in the world. We've only been around for about 300,000 years. So two thirds of our existence occurred in Africa, really the cradle of civilization. This 
was contested for many, many years. There were so many attempts uh, by researchers to say, oh no, there's a, a polygenesis uh, uh, argument that no, human beings emerged at different places around the world and it's not just Africa, but all science since then has shown that no, it's Africa, we haven't found any fossils anywhere else uh, earlier uh, than what we have in Africa. Now, until that changes now, if tomorrow they find some fossil in Russia somewhere that's older, then we have to change that. And we have to be humble enough to say, well, now it's Russia. But until that evidence, if it exists, uh, or anything that changes what we have now, refutes what we have now, we can proudly say that Africa is the birthplace of humanity and was the only home of humanity for two thirds of its existence. So for instance, this is a, a, a replication of uh, a fossil that was from only about 10,000 years ago. So this fossil, uh, and this is the reproduction of what this person would have looked like, uh, this person would have lived around 8,000 BCE. I just wanna do a quick thing in the chat. Where do you think, what country, what modern country do you think this person came from? What modern country do you think that this person came from? If we were, if I was to ask you, uh, where, where do you think this fossil came from? Very relatively recent, this is only 10,000 years old. Somebody take some guesses in the chat. Egypt, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, North African region. Okay. Well, Arlene is right. This is from England, only 10,000 years ago. This is what's called, this, this, this is the earliest human skeleton, intact human skeleton, full human skeleton found in Egypt, uh, not Egypt, excuse me, England. Uh, he, he, it's known, the, the, the fossil remains are known as Cheddar Man. Cheddar Man, not because the person liked cheese, because they were found in the Cheddar Gorge uh, near Somerset, England. So this is the oldest human remains found in England. And recently, within the past decade, because it wasn't that old, it's only 10,000 years old, it seems very old, but when we talk about human beings have been around for 300,000 years, it's not really that old. So in England, in 8,000 BCE, this is what folks look like. And the reason why they know that they look like this is because of advancements we've made in science in terms of uh, genetic sequencing and DNA. So DNA was, it was able to be extracted from these remains because they weren't that old, it's only 10,000 years old. So they took the DNA, they looked at the gene sequencing, they looked at it and they said, okay, the way that this pattern is set up, we have probabilities of what this person looked like based off their genes. So they had certain genes and I'm not a biologist, so I can't get into it in depth, but they said, okay, people with this gene sequence generally have dark to very dark skin. And this person had light eyes. So it was a combination of seeing the transition and dark, very, very curly hair. So this is what was coming out of it. Now, there have been, once this information was leaked, uh, once it came out, once it was published by the researchers that, that, that did this, you had a, a backlash in England, which is still going on about two years ago. They're like, no, uh, 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 you know, DNA sequences, uh, uh, they degrade over time and there's no way that we can know. And it's, it's just probability, even though it's a very, very high probability. That's how this DNA sequence and things work. We're not saying that this is 100%, but the probability is very, very high. It's like, even when you do the paternity test DNA, they say you're 99.9% .9 sure to be the father. So you, that, that's how it works. There's nothing is ever 100%, but the probability that this is what this person looked like was incredibly high. So even very late, less than 10,000 years ago, the people in England looked like this. This is what gives us even more evidence that people spent so much time developing in Africa that this is what early human beings looked like. And, and they, then they went and populated the rest of the world. and. Uh, changed in terms of their skin color, their hair texture, uh, their eye color, so on. So actually not even eye color, we have all the eye colors in Africa. People with green eyes in Africa, brown eyes in Africa, hazel eyes, bright blue eyes in Africa. We have more genetic diversity in Africa itself than anywhere else in the world because we spent so much time developing them. 
over 200,000 years only in Africa. So you have everything you need. You got blonde people in Africa, naturally blonde people, blue eyed people and all that. But those traits become more prominent in other places in the world as we move. You see more people become lighter and blonder and different traits to match whatever environments that they entered into. Uh, so that's a very important thing. Uh, so that's Cheddarman. So going back to Africa 300,000 years ago, what do we do? What, what, what is the history? What do we know? So we know this history from, like I said, genetics, from archaeology, and from paleoanthropology. These are the evidences for what we're about to talk about now. Uh, we have things like this, which might not seem like as much to you, but this is a very important historical record that was left to us from our, by our ancestors. This was found in the Blumbos Caves in South Africa, and it was dated to somewhere between uh, 100,000 and 70,000 years ago. And it's a rock with these carvings in it. Like I said, it may not seem like anything to you, but this shows abstract thinking. The person, man or woman that picked up this rock wanted to draw something, wanted to represent something either in their mind or something that they saw. This shows advanced thought. It shows that our uh, uh, people were uh, thinking about things. They had the time to sit and to think about things and to make representations of what they saw either in their mind or in reality. Or, or, so this is a very important step in who we are as people. It wasn't just about us surviving. We were actually taking time to create symbolic representations of things, abstract representations of things. So very important historical element. Uh, and some of the early examples of writing or pictorial form of writing that coming out of South Africa. In North Africa, in Algeria, 12,000 years ago. So this is about 4,000 years before Cheddar Man appears in, in, in the UK. In Algeria, they're painting scenes of human activity and painting the animals that they see in the caves. And you notice the color that they are. Notice uh, what they're doing. Looks like they're engaging in some type of dancing or, 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 or communal activity. You see the animals there that were important to them. This is all showing evidence of human thought, human creativity, very early in, in, in who we are as a species. So what did we do for the most part? For, when we first developed, what we were were hunters and gatherers. We were hunters and gatherers. We lived in small bands, uh, usually units of you know maybe twenty. Sometimes, if it was a, a an area where uh, you know people could, there was a lot of game and a lot of things to gather uh, in terms of wild vegetables and, and roots and things like that. You may have groups up to 100, 150, but we were pretty much in small bands of groups, and we we hunted. And I have hunting and fishing together because fishing is just hunting in the water. <laughs> that's, that's all it is. And we have evidence of this from the archaeological record. We can find the tools that these people use, uh, stone tools that they use to make bows and arrows, uh, to make uh, uh, flints, to uh, make fishing hooks out of bones from the other animals that they kill. Uh, and we kind of know, based off of our observations of people that still live like this, because excuse me, there are people throughout Central and Southern Africa that are still hunters and gatherers and they're fine living like that. And we should you know, promote that, that, that this is their lifestyle. We're talking about Khoisan people and some other folks, uh, even Batwa people and others in, in, in Central Africa that still live like this. Um, when we know from their social organization that men generally hunted uh, and women generally gathered. And it really, shows us, and this is kind of the proof that we that anthropologists think that it was probably a woman that discovered agriculture, because gathering is a more successful form of food procurement than hunting. Hunting, you might not win. <laughs> you, you go out to hunt an animal, you got to have an, an incredible skill. The animal could be smart. Um, it's, it's dangerous. Um, it's, it, you could go out all day and not come back with anything to eat. But when you're gathering, you know where to look, you know what to, what to get, what's edible, what's not. So some of these African women were some of the first scientists putting things together, learning uh, the methods of, of, of cooking and food preparation, learning how to pick out the best uh, seeds uh, and, and, and the best roots and all these different types of things. And then realizing that if I fence off this area, protect it from, uh, uh, other animals that are trying to eat it, weed the area to make sure other plants aren't choking off these plants 
if I selectively plant uh, the best uh, 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 varieties or the biggest varieties, then the next year they'll grow. This is the beginnings of agriculture. And we know that it's probably a black woman that figured this out, an African woman that, 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 that figured this out in Africa. Now, farming developed other places in, in the Middle East and other places simultaneously. So this is one of those things that did have a polygenesis, agriculture. But in the African context, it was probably a woman. So this is how we live for most of our existence as, as hunters and gatherers until we come, we uh, do have the uh, agricultural revolution, which happens a little bit later. Uh, our, our next step, uh, we were hunters and gatherers for a while. We had that population bottleneck that I talk about. Africans start migrating out of the continent. The continent starts to change to look more like how it is now. And, and once this happens, we develop other forms of social organization based off of all this is based off of what we eat and how we get what we eat. Uh, so when you move from smaller groups of hunters and gatherers, much very mobile, very democratic organization in terms of, of, of how they relate to each other in terms of the roles that people have. And you know, it's kind of hard to have gender inequality uh, when you know, you're, if, it, if there was any type of gender inequality, probably the women were probably more in charge than the men because your only job is to hunt. It wasn't even a whole lot of intercommunal conflict because there wasn't that many people to have conflict with and there was so much space that you can move around. And the women are the ones that are providing food regularly. You, if you're successful uh, with your hunt, and you're bringing it back and another animal doesn't take it from you while you're trying to carry it. So you, you kill a deer and you and your, your, your buddies kill a deer and there might be a lion or something else waiting to you do the work and then they just attack you and take it. So hunting wasn't always successful, gathering was. So if there was any power imbalance, probably the women had the power uh, <laughs> at this point. Um, but one thing start changing, we start to develop other ways of food procurement. And one of them is animal husbandry and herding. We realize that with these, particularly with cattle, it starts with cattle first. Uh, we take these animals and we start building fences around to protect them from predators. And we start to uh, figure out ways to move them from pasture to pasture. And they start to get bigger and fatter. And then after generation after generation, these animals become dependent on human beings to survive. They can't survive in a while. This is domestication. So it starts from herding then it becomes domestication of animals. It starts with cattle. Then they later on, uh, actually sheep and goats come into Africa, really from Western Asia. Uh, so we start to see more sheep and goat herding. Um, and this becomes another way of fuel procurement. People now have meat and milk. And again, we can tell, we know this from agriculture. I mean, uh, excuse me, not agriculture, from archeology. span We know this from genetics. There are certain populations of people in the world and when they're in close proximity to, to, to herders and pastoralists who are, uh, they become uh, lactose tolerant as adults. And there's a genetic, uh, you can see that in the genes of people versus folks that weren't pastoralists are more like they're not, they don't develop a, a, a lactose tolerance as adults. And you see a lot of indigenous people are lactose intolerant. Uh, because and uh, there's a lot of groups in Africa, people that are lactose intolerant because they're not pastoralists. So you see that, and we see that through genetics. And then we see it also in archaeology as we see more of these uh, human communities that we find where the bones of cattle and other things are, are, are buried next to human populations. And we start to see cattle and their artistic representations. So we know that it becomes very important to certain groups at certain times. When this happens, we see human communities uh, they're not, they don't really settle because you need to move around if you're a pastoralist to get better pasture for your animals. But we see these communities become larger and also become more uh, socially unequal, more hierarchical. The more animals that you have under control, the more power you have in the community, the more people uh, uh, have to respect you and, and, and different type of things. We start to see the inequality between men and women start to emerge in some of these communities as well at this time. And we can see this again through the uh, archeological record. Not so much the written record, a little bit in actually the oral tradition when it talks about some of these transitions. Uh, so we, we have that. But the big one, the big one is the agricultural revolution, which happens around 10,000 BCE in Africa, as well as in what's called the Fertile Crescent of Mesopotamia. 
and even uh, further east in, into Asia. This is what really changes things for humanity. Once we start agriculture, which again, probably a black woman is the first person to really start farming, but once we really get into it, then we start to have more settled communities. You don't have to roam around with your herds anymore to find better pasture. You don't have to walk around to do the hunter and gathering thing and following you know, animals that you're hunting. You can settle. Uh, you can, as a result of settling, you can have larger communities. You start to see urbanization occur slowly, slowly, slowly until we start to get these large urban centers. This is the change. And once humans know that they have a reliable food source that they you know, don't have to chase down and hunt, you spend, you have much more time in your day to do other things. Now that you know that your food is going to be there and you figure out ways to store it and, and all this, and, and you're, you're growing cereals and, 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 and uh, yams and, and all these different types of things, fruit trees, you're learning how to do all this and you're genetically modifying crops. You're choosing the best uh, yields and you're putting those together. This is an early form of genetic, genetic modification. We're doing all this. And now with all the free time, you start to think about other things. You start to think about the stars in the sky and the sun and the moon. And, 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 and you're starting to see patterns in nature. You're starting to think about, well, how should we live among each other? What should be our rules in this new settled society? Because in some places, there's not going to be enough land for everybody in this area. How do we regulate that? How do we chart the, the changing of the year? If it doesn't rain, is there any way that we can make it rain? Is there something that we can appeal to? Can we appeal to this disc that I see in the sky every day? Maybe that has something to do with the rain. Maybe if I sacrifice something to it, it'll rain more or it'll ensure that our crops come up. What, what can I do to control these unseen forces to make my life easier? And this we start to see the beginnings of spirituality and religion and philosophy and all these ideas that emerge because human beings now have time to think about that. This is where we'll stop today. And we will see next week how in one particular region in the Nile Valley, which stretches from Ethiopia all the way up into the Mediterranean. So we'll talk about Egypt and Nubia uh, and, and other places, how these new socially complex societies emerge based off of the combination of agriculture and pastoralism and what that looks like in the rise of very, very early African and really world civilizations. So that's what we'll talk about next week. Uh, so we'll leave it there. Um, I'm going to turn off the recording.